Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for having me. It uh, really is delightful. And um, as I've listened in on some of the talks from uh, Steve Trion and uh, from Jeff Mattis, uh, really have enjoyed them kind of setting some of the groundwork, if you like. But uh, hopefully, as we move forward now, going to take you in a slightly different direction. And uh, again, I'm a person who really doesn't mind interruptions. I'm also someone who really doesn't mind lots of questions because I think it's exciting to see a group like this participating in their care and being aware of what's going on with their disease. And so if things I say appear a little different and unusual and things that you didn't understand, please, uh, if you need to write the question down, do that so we can have a chance to talk about them if you like. So you heard a lot so far about what is Waldenstrom's. You've heard a bunch about understanding the tumor cell itself and the genetic mutations that are happening in the cancer cell and the implications of that for therapy, et cetera, as you just heard from Steve Trion. The key question also comes is these cells do not live on their own. They live in an environment. They live with other cells around and particularly they love the bone marrow, as you've already heard. And when we've tried to make cell lines out of these cells, if you just take them and try and grow them, they really don't grow very well. In fact, we got a grant from uh, IWMF and LLS probably 20, 10 years ago to grow cell lines. We uh, tried 67 times and grew one. So it would just tell you that the microenvironment where these cells live is really important in facilitating their growth. And you heard a little bit from Dr. Trion earlier about the fact that cytokines and other proteins are made in response to the malignant cell or by the malignant cell and often these kind of feed the environment and kind of like miracle grow to help those cells have a very happy place where they can, uh, can divide and, and proliferate. So what I'm going to show you is usually when things are going rotten in your body, when you either have an infection or you have tumor cells, your immune system is supposed to come to the rescue. Their job is to look out for troublemakers, show up just like the cops, stop and go, hey, what's going on here, and sort out the troublemakers. The key question is, why is that not happening in Waldenstrom's? And as I'll show you in a minute, we're trying different therapeutic ways to try and make it work better. Now, I will say to you that this is a little more forward-looking because we spent a lot of our research time thus far focusing a lot on the tumor itself I think it's, this is a more recent thing to focus in on how can we make the immune system work better. But this, I think, is where much of the future lies, along with some of the therapies you've already heard. <clears throat> so this is just to remind me, to remind you, that this is a systemic disease. So what you can see in the top left is a patient who has got, let me just see if I can get this uh, to work, there we go. So this is basically showing that it can be in the bone marrow. That's what this person here is having, a bone marrow test, as many of you will remember having had. Secondly, you can have lots of lymph nodes that can go different places in your body. These lymph nodes are normal. So I kind of see, again, of using a police analogy, if you like, this is kind of where people get trained at the, at the academy. The bone marrow is where the cells are born. Then when they actually graduate from the academy, they will travel out to lymph nodes and the lymph node is like the precinct. That's kind of where they'd be based. But they then travel out everywhere around your body as ways to kind of interact with the infections that you heard about from toll-like receptors. Toll-like receptors are the detection agents for those infections. And so these cells are traveling around and typically are ready to respond if they see something that looks like an infection. So what happens in Waldenstrom's exactly? Well, if you can imagine that B cell saw some kind of bacteria, got itself all kind of wild and aggravated, it changes from a B lymphocyte to a plasma cell and normally would make antibodies. And the antibody it would make first is an IgG antibody. That's the quick and dirty response. That's the big molecule that sticks onto everything to shut down the infection while the body continues to refine things and make an IgG molecule, which is the SCUD missile that will actually then specifically take out the bacteria. When you have Waldenstrom's, you get stuck in that process between the B lymphocyte and the plasma cell. So that's why you hear, when we look in the bone marrow, about a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma between a lymphocyte and a plasma cell is where it got stuck. 
and it then should be no surprise that IgM is the problem because that cell makes the quick and dirty big protein, the IgM molecule. And that's why people with Waldenstrom's have got two problems, lymphoplasmacytic cells in the bone marrow and IgM protein circulating around in the blood. This just shows you some of the testing that we typically do. This person you can see has lots of big anti uh, lymph nodes in the, in the abdomen. You can see that shown on PET scan right here. I just wanted to highlight that as we're thinking about immunotherapy, you've got to remember that people look under the microscope, pathologists do, to look and see what kind of disease somebody has. And this is a variety of different lymphomas, but obviously today we're talking about Waldenstrom's. So when you're looking at Waldenstrom's, under the microscope are what these cells are called lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma. And you can see this arrow points to this cell. This is a plasmacytic cell and you can see the nucleus is off toward one side and it's got this blue cytoplasm because the blue cytoplasm is the IgM protein that has been made by the cell. And you can tell that protein does lots of unfortunate things. Here is somebody with significant Raynaud's phenomenon so their hands don't get enough blood supply because the, the, uh, the IgM is too high. This person has visual problems because their eyes the little blood vessels are leaky or they're becoming kind of sausagey where it's actually difficult for the protein that's slowing the blood flow down through the eyes. So all of that to say there are lots of malignant cells and you heard about those but the key question is where's the immune system in all of this? So if we go back to one of those uh, specimens and go okay don't look so much now for the cancer cell look to see where are the immune cells. In other words when you've had some kind of accident or tragedy or, or crime, where are the police? Are they coming to check and see what's wrong? And the answer is, there are lots of immune cells present either in the bone marrow or in this case, in the lymph node. And this is shown here mainly by the CD3 stain, which are T lymphocytes. These are other cells in the immune system that are the, more the hand-to-hand -hand combat, if you like, of the immune system. And they show right up first away to go, what's going on right here? So there are lots of cells present the key question is, why are they not doing a good job of actually killing the cancer cell? Well, again, as you heard from Dr. Trion, and I think it's important to understand, is there is a network of things that are happening all at the same time when it comes to signaling. Equally, there is a network of things that are going on when it comes to cells communicating with each other. And as you also heard, there is a network of proteins, signaling molecules, that are happening. So when you look in the bone marrow, you'll see not only the malignant cell, but lots of other cells that are present. And all of these cells are interacting with one another. So even though the immune cells are there, many times they are told to calm down and relax and go home and not do anything too much to rock the boat. And because of that, the cancer cell escapes and begins to proliferate and basically shrugs off any unnecessary kind of uh, vigilance that comes from the immune system. So when we say what can we do therapeutically, I think it's important to know that we're going to talk about this as we go through. Immune cells are typically switched off. So even though they're there, they're taking a nap. And the question is, how can you fix that? How can you take them from taking a nap to be wide awake doing their job? Sometimes they're there, sometimes they're ready to roll, but they really just didn't get told what exactly to do. They're an enthusiastic young recruit, kind of all bushy-eyed and, and, and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and yet don't kind of, haven't had instructions from the captain yet to tell them what to do and where to go. And sometimes, even when they do go, they can't find the tumor cell. They kind of are running around like headless chickens, if you like, not actually knowing where to attack and what to go after. So the therapies that you're going to hear me talk about are trying to do three things. One, if the cell went to sleep, wake it up. Two, if it couldn't really work out how to get activated, give it a poke. And if it ran around like a headless chicken not knowing where to go, give it some direction. Tell it where to get stuck on, what to actually do. And so you'll see me going to be talking about different ways in which that is trying to be achieved to improve the outcome. So the first thing is cells that are switched off. So how on earth does that happen? Why is your immune system not on the ball, on its game, all the time? 
Well, it's because that's actually a natural thing that happens, that your immune system gets switched off. You don't actually want your immune system wildly switched on all the time. You can imagine if you get a, uh, an infection in your finger, it's really important for the first day that your immune system be really switched on so it fixes the infection. But once the infection is fixed and all the bugs are killed, you want it to calm down because otherwise that really painful kind of you know, spot is going to stay painful for days and eventually it'll actually start scoring, causing a lot of scarring. So you want the immune system shut, to shut down. So there are natural mechanisms that when the fight is over, where the cops come, they draw the, uh, the yellow tape and go, okay, we're all done here, everyone can go home, nothing to see, please stop watching. And in essence, what you're doing is taking those immune cells and switching them off. So I'm gonna take you back to biology 101. So you might have thought you forgot this, but it's important if you're thinking about immune system and how it works. If you have an immune problem and you get an infection, your body will go along, grab onto the bacterial proteins or viral proteins and come back to the immune system and say, look what I found. A little bit like your dog who's been out in the backyard for a long time and suddenly brings in the thing it found in the backyard and very, very uh, proudly sort of deposits that for you right on your doorstep. You're not all that excited about what he brought in, but bottom line is the immune system does the same. Brings back things that it says, look what I found. And then the immune system goes, that's threatening, that's a danger, and will actually respond to it. So how it does that, the antigen presenting cell shows the T cell what it found. That's the first message. But to stop just non-specific thing happening, what you need to see is actually a second message, and that comes through a co-stimulatory system. So what happens is you get one message to say, look what I found, the second message is to say, you better pay attention. Then the immune system wakes up, and will attack the system, whatever it is that the immune system is seeing. The challenge, however, is it's also possible that you'll get a negative signal. Look what I found, don't worry about it. And that's actually important in normal biology because if it's self, you don't want yourself to attack yourself, so then it will switch it off. <clears throat> but the cancer is pretty smart and it will often go, I'm on your side, don't worry about it. And when it does that, the immune system shuts down. The third option that can happen, and this is why sometimes you need a poke, is you get no message. It's just, look what I found, and nothing. So then the immune system goes, what, 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 and nothing to do. So that's where a, a stimulatory signal will be really important. This just reminds me to tell you that there are lots of different signals. There can be positive, those are all the ones to your uh, right, this is these ones here, or all of these are negative signals. So the immune system is a lot more complicated. It's like, you know, Boeing 737, if you like. Some of them fly well and some of them don't. Um, but they're pretty complicated. And even when things aren't quite right, the pilot struggles sometimes to fix what's not right because there's lots of things happening. And in the immune system, the same is true. Lots of different signals, some positive, some negative. So the signal that comes to the immune system and what happens right afterwards really matters. So the first thing we want to talk about are exhausted cells. So what happens many times is if you keep crying wolf to the immune system, you wear it out. So here you can see a T cell that's clearly been worn out and all of these things that are at the top are ways in which we can tell that. But if you keep going, Hey, immune system, look what I found, look what I found, look what I found, look what I found. Eventually the immune system goes, look, enough already. You know, I'm not had it, I don't want to hear it, and I'm shutting down. When that happens, then all kinds of things can happen behind its back, and clearly if we could wake up the immune system, that would be important. So you might go, well, what evidence do you really have that that is true? So here is just some biology looking at cells that look exhausted. And this population right here have these proteins called TIM3 and PD-1 on them. You can see that population there and that population there. And these are cells that look exhausted. The key question is, are they? So one of the ways we can tell is that if you activate them, you can see these little peaks here. The cells proliferate and make a little peak. If you see these gray cells, they got poked and nothing happened. Why? Because those cells that look exhausted seem to behave in a not very activatable fashion. This just says, well, are these cells present in the bone marrow? And you can see this brown staining shows that to be true. 
And then I mentioned to you that the negative signal comes from the cancer cells. And this is just showing here that in Waldenstrom's, that negative signal to go, there's nothing to see, we're all good, get a negative signal is actually a lot higher than in normals. So you have cells that have the potential to be exhausted and already looking exhausted and behaving exhausted, and then they get a message to go, go home, don't do anything. You take an exhausted cell and you shut that cell down. So part of the problem with the immune system is it's getting shut down. So could you stop that? So in other words, maybe the cell's getting a little worn out, but rather than letting it get shut down, could you actually shut off? So it's like taping over the off signal. Tape it over so that that way, even if you wanted to flip the switch, you couldn't. This is just where we would do that. This is this negative signal that you get between PD-L1 and PD-1. And if you just block that, could you not result in a better outcome? This just shows that there are lots of these PD-1 positive cells often present in the tumor. And this is that first message I mentioned, and then this is the negative message. If you could stop the negative message, this would make all of the difference. So as it happens, in lymphomas in general, and I'm going to show you some data now in Waldenstrom's, there is evidence to say that it works in some cases really well and in some cases less well. And part of the reason is it depends exactly what's wrong with your immune system. So as I said, we're trying to do three things that I'm, going to t that I'm taking you through. The first one is if there's an exhausted cell who's getting shut down, stop it from being shut down. So often if that's the only problem you've got and you take away that shutting down message, the cell will wake back up again. Sometimes, as I'll show you in a minute, the cell's a little too shut down and it's a little bit like it's more in a coma and it doesn't actually want to wake up. So now you might need to take out a shock collar or something and kind of give it a little bolt of electricity to go get up and get on with it. So an actually an activating signal. And then right at the end, I'll show you about when you can't find where the cell is, the cancer cell is, how do you get the immune system to see it? So back now to just talking again about this inhibitory signal, shutting down the immune system. So when we've tr done trials blocking that message, uh, the, the off message with a drug called nivolumab, you can see that in follicular lymphoma, about more than a third of patients have benefited. In diffuse large B cell lymphoma, about a similar number. T cell lymphoma, less so. Multiple myeloma, not any patients at all have really benefited, showing that the immune systems are different. In the world of Hodgkin lymphoma, so that's a distant cousin to Waldenstrom's if you like, this has been a home run. So this just shows you a patient with very extensive lymph nodes in their armpits and neck, etc., dramatically better. This is actually a fun story. This guy's 26. He uh, has Hodgkin lymphoma for a long time and uh, was told he was going to hospice. Nothing to do. No, it ran out of options. So he called down and he said, you guys got anything? We said, well, we have a clinical trial. We'd love you to participate. So this is a real strong plug for participating clinical trials because it matters. So he came down and he got on the trial. And after he got the drug in the afternoon, he was driving home in the car and he called me and he said, it's working. I said, well, yeah, come now. You know, you've just got the drug like four, 45 minutes ago. Are you kidding me? He said, no, no, no. I'm not sweating and itching like I was. And he was right. Within six weeks, this is the second scan here, you can see dramatically better. He stayed on the drug for two years. Then the study required him to stop. When he stopped, about eight months later, you can see the lymph nodes started to grow back again. Then we could restart the drug as per the protocol, and you can see he responded again. And he has remained in remission now for more than five years. So bottom line is in Hodgkin lymphoma, this has been very successful. In Waldenstrom's, we don't have a lot of evidence yet, but I would say that in a small percentage of patients, and those are all the little green bars that you can see here, uh, the response rate's been about 40%. So I think what that tells us is the immune cells and what they do in Hodgkin, where the response rate runs about 75%, compared to Waldenstrom's, where it's maybe 35 to 40%, shows that the immune system is different, but there are still cells present within Waldenstrom's bone marrow and lymph nodes that if you stop them from being shut down, they would wake up and actually take action against the cancer cell. This is a similar drug called a CTLA-4 antibody blocking uh, agent, and it blocks another off signal. 
This is just to show that this agent is not quite as effective, but the principle still works. So what do I hope you're hearing so far? First thing is, the immune system in Waldenstrom's matters. But the problem is, the immune system in Waldenstrom's is dysfunctional. And it's dysfunctional because of three problems. Either the cells are exhausted and worn out, or two, they are kind of so shut down they need to be activated and re-poked, as it were. Or three, they don't know what to go after, and so they haven't done a good job of targeting the cancer cell. So the first thing that I just showed you is if your system, your cells are shut down and exhausted, could you block that, that signal that is doing that to them? And the answer is yes, in part, in Waldenstrom's. In a disease like Hodgkin, absolutely. But first principle is stopping the off signal seems to have efficacy and benefit for the future in Waldenstrom's. Well, what about trying to do more? And that is now, why don't you just poke that, that T cell? That cell is just kind of not doing its job, so give it a nudge. Get it to do its thing. So there are a number of therapies where we are now specifically giving an activating signal. So remember I told you that you need to get a second activating signal, and in this case, could you get such an activating signal? So the first one is through a protein called CD27. And this is just to say that this is an antibody that's very well tolerated, and in patients so far, not a lot of people have received it, but it's been effective in a small percentage of patients. Certainly to say that activating the immune system would in some degree show some degree of, re of response. This is a second antibody. This is an antibody targeting a protein called CD40, also an activating signal. And this, as you know, is what's called a waterfall plot, but you can see about a third of patients have a response to treatment. So you're hearing like this 30 to 40 percent number a lot, and I think what we're seeing is that people are sort of in three buckets. That's the one third of patients where the immune system is kind of exhausted and run down. About a third of patients where the problem is it needs to be activated. And then as I'll show you now, about a third of the time or maybe more where you actually need to tell the immune system who to attack. Just to, before I do that, one last thing to say that side effects that you see with these immune agents are very different to the side effects that you see with other drugs. Because now you're not actually targeting the cancer, you're targeting the immune system. So most of the side effects are immune side effects. So the things that you get are all the places where your body is exposed to foreign proteins. So you can typically get rashes, you can get lung infiltration or, or, or a cough or shortness of breath, you can get an upset stomach, some diarrhea type problems. All of it is because that's where immune cell cells sit and then when you activate them, they can cause additional symptoms. However, if you take how many people get that, about one out of 10. So most, patient, most patients tolerate this really well, but about one out of 10 people can get significant side effects. <clears throat> so problem number one, your immune cells are exhausted. How to fix that? Block the message that's actually making them exhausted. Problem number two, they are really just inactive, and they are kind of a, like your teenage kid, asleep at like two in the afternoon. You need to kind of just go in there and go, get up, come on, time to get on, and poke the immune system. Third problem is, it doesn't know where to go. These are your bushy-eyed and uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed troops ready to roll, who have just kind of no idea what the plan is. Well, who do I go after? And part of that is, cancer is smart. So cancer tries to hide. So remember Waldenstrom's, the problem is the immune system. B cells are part of the immune system. So these are like cops on the take. So it's a little hard to tell who's a rotten cop. You've got to look really hard. You need to find a way to pick them out. And that's what happens here. Remember how I said the immune system shows other parts of the immune system what they found? Well, these cancer cells just stop showing. They don't actually have a badge, like an unmarked police car. Always get caught by the traffic guys when they're unmarked. <clears throat> and this is the problem. If you can't tell what to go after, all of those T cells are all ready to go, but they don't know what to go for. So how could you fix that? So this is what is known as CAR T cells. 
chimeric antigen receptor T cells. And in essence, what you've done is you've taken a T cell and you've put a magnet on it, an automatic docking site that sticks to tumor cells. So how do you do that? Well, here's this, this uh, T cell receptor that would dock onto that whatever the immune system is showing it. But if you took an antibody and you put that, and you remember I mentioned you needed two messages, you needed the here's what I've got and here's why you should care message. If you just put that all into one thing, so when it saw what it needed to see, it just automatically got activated, that's really what a chimeric antigen receptor does. So the way in which it's done is it's built with this binding site, what's called a co-stimulatory domain. So this is what makes it stick. This is what makes it mad. And they put it in with a virus into the T cells. And there are different ways in which you can do that. How exactly does this work? Well, you take T cells out of a patient. Patient may receive some chemotherapy just to beat down the immune system. In the meantime, you're making these cells. You take the T cells. You put into them this viral vector, the cells then put on their surface an automatic magnet, docking site, that would stick onto Waldenstrom cells. And does this work? Well, in various B cell malignancies, this has worked very well, in, particularly in patients that have been very resistant to chemotherapy. And there have been a number of different trials of different molecules that have shown this to work quite well. Again, it does have some side effects. So the challenge is, I joke and tell people, this is like taking a cat, put the cat in the box, take the box, shake the box, let the cat out. Well, you can imagine the cat comes out, you know, kind of all like super wound up and scratching everything. Well, if you put it right next to what you want it to scratch, it'll scratch it really good. So in essence, we're taking the immune system, shaking it up, letting it out, and sticking it onto a Waldenstrom cell and goes, that's what you want to grab. Immune system gets really wound up, does a lot of biting and scratching. Hopefully the cancer cell is killed off. The problem is, unfortunately, it doesn't scratch in a very discriminatory manner. If you happen to be the, the owner who's trying to calm the cat down, good luck, you're probably going to get a few scratches too. And in essence, CAR T cells have some risks because of that. So what we call cytokine release syndrome, where you feel like you really are just very sick with low blood pressure and feeling very really lightheaded and dizzy and uh, can be a problem. You can get neurotoxicity where you can't think straight. So if you can think of times when you really had a bad fever and spoke all kinds of nonsense, you know, that's kind of in essence the same principle. But CAR T cells will eventually calm down and clearly if they've really targeted the cancer cell, you can get a substantial response. So what do I hope you heard with all of that? Is that we've heard, learned a lot this morning about Waldenstrom's and about the malignant B cell and fantastic progress has been made in understanding the mutations and what's going on in the malignant cell. We actually know quite a lot less about the immune system and the bone marrow microenvironment. And so what I've hoped to show with you is something of what's being done in that space. And I think this is looking down the road to go, this is what may be coming in the future. Getting your immune system to go after your tumor. And as I said to you, we've got three problems. Problem number one is the immune system has got switched off, exhausted, tired from the endless crying wolf of, hey, there's cancer here, hey, there's cancer here, hey, there's cancer here. Eventually, this immune system just shut down. Or otherwise, it was wanting to get going, problem number two, but it really wasn't activated. It was like your teenage kid who always seems to be taking a nap and not actually doing what, mowing the lawn or whatever. <clears throat> problem number three, is that the immune system is really ready to go, but it can't see what to go after. So if you could just dock it right onto the cancer cell, that would make a difference. So if the T cells really are switched off, prevent that. And those are blocking antibodies. Problem number two, if they can't be, if they're not activated, poke them, activate them. Problem number three, they won't lock onto their targets, we'll give them a new way and that's the CAR T cell therapy. So with that, I'll end. Thank you very much. And that gentleman has a question. <clears throat>